always that moment when my heart stops as the screen goes blank and we get brought over. May it please the court, counsel Keith Upson for appellant Carl Anacreon. I'd like to reserve two minutes if I may, judge. Okay. <clears throat> Not seeing any frantic gestures. I assume everybody can hear me okay. Yeah, we can hear you fine. Thank you, judge. I'm also sure everyone caught that I had consistently miscited Jones in both briefs. It's at volume 187 of the Southern Third, not 183. I apologize for that. I wish I'd caught that sooner. Wish I'd never made the mistake. The officer's mission here was to give a warning or issue a citation for window tent. That mission was or should have been completed when Mr. Anacreon's license and registration came back clean, without warrants, full stop. There's no question as to identity of who the officer was dealing with. It was Carl Anacreon, just like his valid Florida driver's license said. I also think there's no question really that the deputy wasn't being truthful with Mr. Anacreon about he was just going to give him a warning, uh, particularly when he asked Mr. Anacreon to get out of the car. Um, but I understand that the current state of the law is essentially, to paraphrase, that it's okay if law enforcement lies to people, which I think it's clear the deputy was doing when he said, I'm just going to give you a warning. You don't have to go to court. You just pay a fine. Easier for me, I think, is is what he said. It, 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 it was transcribed unintelligible for me. So I don't know that he said it's easier for me. At one point, the deputy said, I got you. But it wasn't in a, I gotcha. It, it was more of a, a bonding context. I got you. You know, you don't even have to go to court. You just pay a fine. I don't think any of that was true. I think the officer was already doing something other than fulfilling his mission as to the tent citation or warning, he was already conducting a, a trafficking investigation. So all the subsequent questions and concerns, the rerunning of ID, the follow-up questions, none of that was in furtherance of the tent warning or citation, the primary mission. That was essentially all custodial interrogation furtherance of, of what was a sua sponte trafficking investigation. I think it's clear from the record that one way or another, Mr. Anacreon was going to be detained until the deputy got that dog sniff. The officer's authority for the seizure ends when the tasks tied to the traffic infraction are or reasonably should have been completed. When determining the reasonable time to complete the required task, the court must consider whether the police diligently pursue their investigation. Those are, I've omitted the citations, but those are quotes directly from the Fourth District in Jones that can be found at page 347. Now, the reason the deputy gave for wanting to have this, this second tier review of identification, notwithstanding the fact that the license came back fine, the registration was fine, and there were no warrants. Because I'll give you, he, that was in furtherance of the traffic tent. We expect officers to take license and registration and run that information and do a computer search. But the reason the deputy gave for wanting that second tier review was supposedly tied to the responses Mr. Anacreon had given about where he was going and why and for how long. And two things about that. First of all, none of those responses gave rise to reasonable suspicion to initiate a traffic investigation. And probably more importantly, none of that really had anything to do with the window tent issue or mission. Um, and, and the state's theory has been fairly consistent from the trial level to on appeal, that because some aspects of Mr. Anacreon's story um, seem suspicious, that gave the officer carte blanche to continue to detain him to sort all this out. In fact, 
uh, the state has argued at the at the trial court level and on appeal what's essentially victim blaming. If Mr. Nagrion had only been forthcoming with all those secondary questions about your social, whether or not you're a Heat fan, how long are you going to be there, what's your favorite color, you know, none of that has anything to do with the traffic tent, the basis for the stop. And I think more importantly, we don't have a system in place, thank goodness, yet, by which black men operating motor vehicles have any obligation to file itineraries with law enforcement, outlining where they're going, for how long, how long they're going to be there. And I think those things matter here. I think the fact from its inception, it's apparent this officer was going to detain this gentleman unless and until he got that sniff. I, I think that makes a difference. You know, harder from my point of view to defend are the cases where it's a routine traffic stop. And as soon as the window comes down, the giant clouds of marijuana smoke go billowing out of the vehicle. That's just not factually what we've got here. What we've got here is an officer who prides himself on making hundreds, if not thousands of window tent stops and detaining individuals until he can get that dog sniff. I'm a little alarmed by the lack of activity from the panel, but I'm more than prepared to just to, to keep on going and, and particularly Judge Black. I, I just knew Judge Black was going to have something for me at this point. Um, so the, the identification issue that the that the state judge you're 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 muted, Judge. No one's talking that I know of, Mr. Upson. So could continue, please. Oh I I'm sorry. I I think I was on mute. I think all I said was it's all been pretty straightforward so far, but please continue. Thank, thank you, Judge. Well, and it's consistent with my briefs. Um, it's not unusual in preparation for argument for me to read the briefs and wish I had said X, Y, or Z, but um, I don't think I left anything ambiguous about exactly what I feel and why about the issues here. Here's what's really problematic, though, in a, in a Fourth Amendment context about how this played out factually. Mr. Upton, um, maybe, maybe, maybe I can help you a little bit. You spent a lot of time talking about how you feel and thought, but you haven't talked about the actual evidence in the record in this case, and that's really what we're interested in. So maybe you might want to talk about that instead of what you feel and think. Well, Judge, that's what... in. In, in quoting the officer and the basis, I mean, that that is from the record and what we have to work with. And I think it's apparent from the face of the record, my, my assertions that this was going to be a, a trafficking investigation from its inception and the officer was not being honest. I suppose one reason I have to emphasize the words that came out of the officer's mouth um, at hearing so significantly, and it would be a fair question from the panel, how long did it prolong it? How long did the secondary review to address a, a fictitious identification issue when there really was no identification? How long did that prolong it? And we don't know from this record. I can't say if it was two minutes or if it was 20 minutes or two hours, um, which is why I think it's more critical from the facts in the record that it was clear from the inception that Mr. Nacreon was gonna be detained until he got till the officer got the dog sniff, regardless of how long it took, um, which is exactly what, what happened. And of course, the state's position is that, you know, gosh, if Mr. Anacreon had just complied and answered all those second tier questions um, truthfully or, or without causing suspicion, he'd have, I guess, been about his way uh, without incident, either a warning or a citation for, for tent which is, is, is really, I think, a red herring. Um, the problem in Fourth Amendment analysis, we, we tend to have moved toward a, the ends justify the means in Fourth Amendment analysis. And, and the problem with that on the facts before the court in Mr. Anacreon's situation is 
the hypothetical stop of the 30 year old black male physician that the same deputy made that same morning and detained until he could get the dog sniff, but who was sent about his way. That hypothetical stop individual had his fourth process, fourth amendment rights violated just the same as Mr. Anacreon did. But the hypothetical physician who got sent about his way doesn't get to bring that violation before this court. It's only in circumstances like Mr. Anacreon's where there's actually the heroin in the trunk of the car. And I can appreciate it might be difficult for the court under what I'm characterizing as the ends justify the means for the amendment analysis. Hey, the deputy was right. You know, he detained him long enough and got the dog sniff and turns out he was right. It's actually only in this sort of situation that we get to bring to the court the violation. And here's why Jones is so critical to the facts of this case, because it was a three minute, it was three minutes that, that got added in Jones. And why the authority in Jones talks about any conduct that prolongs or delays that primary mission is constitutionally unacceptable. So just because the officers created this second tier identification concern theory and furtherance of their custodial interrogation of Mr. Anacreon pursuant to their trafficking investigation, they don't get to say, oh, we didn't have time to finish issuing the warning. Identification wasn't an issue. If he didn't have his ID, that'd be something different. If his ID wasn't a valid Florida license that said he was who he says he was, that might have been something different. If he didn't have the registration even, I mean, these are things reasonable. But once these fictions begin to pile up, it became apparent that the truth of what I asserted initially, that from the officer's own words, when he instructed him to get out of the car, there's really no question he wasn't being truthful with Mr. Nacreon about that. And what bothers, what's more problematic about those facts here is because it's Mr. Nacreon's truthfulness or lack thereof as to those secondary questions and furtherance of the trafficking investigation that the state uses as their justification for prolonging his, in, his detention until they could get the dog sniff. Restated, it's not the guy who got away because the dog didn't alert that gets to present the Fourth Amendment violation, even though it occurred in that situation as well. Any delay from the primary purpose of the stop or how long it should have taken. And I think I said somewhere in the briefs as well, this officer may have been the, the least efficient officer. How long does it take to write a warning? He wasn't writing him a warning. He was holding him until he could get the dog sniff. Notwithstanding the fact that he was right and notwithstanding the fact that the, the dog alerted, it still constitutes a violation of Mr. Anacreon's Fourth Amendment rights. Uh, Jones is clear. We don't have to establish it was a three hour delay. Any actions of law enforcement that prolonged that primary tent issue is constitutionally unacceptable. And you've got to enforce it in cases where the heroin was in the trunk because you're not ever gonna hear from the people where it wasn't. And with that, I'd like to reserve, or my, my two minutes, still my two minutes. Judge, Judge Morris, you're on you. mute. Um, you're at 14 minutes. So if you only want two, that's fine. You have as much as five if you want it. Oh, thank you, Judge. OK. All right. Counsel, you're up. May it please the court, Peter Koklanis for the Attorney General's Office. The stop was not over in this case. Identity verification was still in progress and there was still outstanding doubts as to his identity at the point that the dog had been run around the car. 
and any verification is part of giving a warning and a reasonable time to complete the stop includes a uh, verification of the identity, which may take slightly longer or shorter, depending on which specific doubts and data uh, is before the police officers. Now, two points in response to what Mr. Upson said. Uh, the trial judge did have a superior, superior vantage point and found the law enforcement credible. So as to what Judge Morris said, um, what Mr. Upson feels his interpretation of their credibility, there's no basis to find them not credible as a matter of law on appeal. And this was not a pretext because Officer Meyer arrived in 2.5 minutes. If he had wanted to, he could have run his dog right then. Uh, instead, he took the driver's license from Silva and went to run the background check and then found these red flags that he talked about, including two different names popping up in JIS, which he said could be a result of one of them using the other's name as an AKA, either the brother or him could have used the other's identity as an AKA uh, or some sort of identity problem. Then obviously all the other red flags that are elaborated in the briefs. So if, if police officers had wanted to do this as a pretext, they could have done it much earlier. It actually feels very organic in the sense that they they might not have run the dog if he had not lied about his social security. That seems to be the kind of trigger event that really stokes their concerns. And they might not have asked for the social security number if there weren't those discrepancies, including the two names popping up in the JIS system. So it just kind of seems like one red flag after another came along that got bigger and bigger until Meyer said to himself, you finish resolving this to Silva, you finish resolving the social security uh, question, I'm gonna run my dog real quick, which he does, and then the dog alerts. So it seems like a very genuine and uh, natural stop, at least that's what the trial judge found and there was competent evidence to support that. Um, there's no bright line rule that handing documents back ends a stop. <clears throat> and the mission includes ordinary inquiries of which this was one. I'd point out that the trial judge made some very specific findings, including finding law enforcement credible. He found that the video tracked and confirmed the testimony, that there were no significant discrepancies between the testimony and the video, no lag time in the videos, which meant that law enforcement didn't drag their feet and that the sniff occurred relatively quickly. Now, nothing in this record refutes those findings. And under the standard of review, the ruling is presumed correct and we interpret all evidences all evidence in uh, the light most favorable to sustaining the ruling. So uh, in this case, the appellant has the burden of appeal of overcoming that presumption of correctness. And in this case, he has not met that burden. If there's no questions, I'll respectfully ask you to affirm. Thank you. Mr. Upson, you have up to five if you want it. Thank you, Judge. I'm not being facetious when I say there, there was no doubt about his identity. So I appreciate counsel's argument and the state's argument's been consistent. He brought this about himself, which is why I called it victim blaming. But his license was his license. There's no question this is Carl and Acreon in state prison, just like it said on his license within those first 30 seconds. The tenth mission was done. It was done. And then they kept him more. So everything that happened after his license and registration came back valid and there were no warrants, everything that happened after was something else. And that something else was the constitutionally impermissible delay in furtherance of what was essentially fabrications in their minds. What they did was they just kept him as long as they wanted to and kept asking him questions. And the Constitution doesn't permit it. Jones, relying on Rodriguez, any time added to that beyond the basis for the stop is impermissible. So one red flag after another about the window tent? No. No, the window tent encounter's over. All that second tier interrogation happened after the officer had the time to reasonably complete the basis for the stop. 
And again, I understand there are exceptions, hence the smoke, marijuana smoke billowing out the window. I, I get it. Not liking his answers about where he was going or how long he was going to be there. I mean, even in Jones, factually, I believe uh, the decision says the officer testified about, about visible nervousness of Jones. You don't even have that on the record here. The officer just didn't like his answers. It seems suspicious. Why did it seem suspicious? Well, because he's had drug interdiction training and he's made hundreds, if not thousands of window tent stops on black men with Miami heat license plates because sometimes he gets drugs. The basis for the stop, the tent, it was over. If he issued the warning or citation or not, it was over. Everything else was impermissible delay on top of that. And we ask that you vacate with and remand with instructions accordingly. If there aren't any questions, well, I know you've got a full docket. We'll let the court get on with the rest of your, the rest of your morning. Okay. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Our next case.